afternoon and welcome to this Hive webinar. Um, my name is Petra Morris and I work for Cooperatives UK. We are the membership body that represents the thousands of cooperatives around the UK. This Hive webinar today is focusing on platform cooperatives and we're helping to create hopefully fairer digital businesses that are owned by their members, the users and the workers in those cooperatives. Um, this Hive webinar is part of a series of Hive webinars that we've been running since the end of last year and continuing into February. We've introduced cooperatives to different audiences um, and we really feel that cooperatives are a much more democratic, successful business that puts their members at the heart of, of, of the business. These Hive webinars are part of our Hive business support programme, which has been running for six years. Um, it's a programme that's delivered and managed by Cooperatives UK in partnership with our member, the Cooperative Bank. Um, so we're delighted that they've supported um, this programme of support for new cooperatives to start and existing cooperatives. And it's very much part of their ethical ba banking policy and their values and principles. Um, so I'm going to, um, we've got quite a few speakers um, on the webinar today, and I'm going to um, say a bit more about them um, shortly. But in terms of housekeeping, um, this is a webinar which is being recorded, and it will be sent out to all participants and, and also uploaded to the website. So it is available to you if you miss anything or if you want to check anything. Um, if you want to ask any questions, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. You can ask questions as we go along and we may respond to them in the chat, or if we have time at the end, hopefully we can answer those questions and some of our speakers can answer those questions. Um, so we have a few speakers on today. Um, so um, I will be, um, um, I'm also delighted that this um, webinar has been delivered in partnership because it's um, particularly aimed at audiences in Scotland today. Um, and our member, Cooperatives UK member, Cooperative Development Scotland, um, is part of that partnership. And I'll be handing over shortly to Suzanne Orchard, who looks after that as part of Scottish Enterprise. Um, our other speakers today are Vika Rogers, who is our programme manager at Cooperatives UK and manages the Unfound programme, which supports platform cooperatives. Um, and she'll be taking you through what a platform cooperative is. Um, we're also joined today by Jen Smith, who is a founder member of Signalize. It's a sign language interpreting service that uses a digital platform to connect to its members, um, the, the people um, who are deaf and the interpreters who provide those services. Um, and I'll also be joined um, by Kaylee Reed, who's a member of the Open Food Network, a cooperative whose members um, collectively and own this platform um, and they use it to trade the food that they produce. Um, so there are lots of um, good examples of actual cooperatives. So I'm going to hand over now to my colleague over at Cooperative Development Scotland, Suzanne Orchard, who's going to say a little bit um, about what they do in Scotland and why, why they're on the call today with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Hi, everyone. Big warm welcome to you all. Thank you to so many of you managed to make time and join us today. Really delighted to, to see you. Um, hope you're all ready for this, for this fab intro into platform co-ops and to hear from our uh, fabulous speakers today. As Petra said, I'm Suzanne Orchard. I work um, for Cooperative Development Scotland within Scottish Enterprise, but we do work across um, the whole of Scotland as, as a region, um, Highlands and Islands and South of Scotland, to raise awareness of and support the exploration and setup of cooperative um, business models. Um, to mirror what, what Petra said, we, you know, we, we're really passionate about co-ops and how they offer a fair alternative to traditional business models, um, as she said, by putting the power and control in the hands of, of, it, of its members. We've worked to promote and support a huge variety of different cooperatives over the years, but we're really delighted to be venturing into this relatively new, exciting space um, of platform co-ops alongside the very knowledgeable uh, Co-ops UK. So I just wanted to touch on, um, in terms of, of support, Cooperative Development Scotland do, do provide um, exploratory and set up support for, for anybody really who's interested in um, exploring a cooperative business model for their project or venture. 
Um, but just wanted to say that there is support available here from, from both organisations and we're both really um, keen and, and, and passionate about making sure your project gets the best start possible. So no, no wrong door there. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Vika, who's going to take us on this fabulous um, journey into platform co-ops. Thank you, everyone. I hope it, you enjoy it. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so just before we start, I just I'm just going to activate a poll. Um, if you could kindly just uh, fill it in. It's just really to get a sense of who's in the audience, if you already know about co-ops, if you know about platform co-ops and, and what brought you here. So I'm just going to leave that up um, for, sorry, I have to launch it, leave it up for a few minutes. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, so I'm just going to leave that there for a few minutes and I'll start introducing myself. Um, so, as mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Vika Rogers and I run the Unfound program, which has been set up to facilitate the development of the platform cooperative sector in the UK, uh, delivered by Cooperatives UK and supported by the Cooperative Bank. Um, the main the program mainly focuses on providing business support for platform co-ops, uh, but also we do work around awareness raising because it's a very new area. We try to channel funding or at least support um, platform co-ops in understanding their funding uh, opportunities, um, and we do some work around policy. So let's see if we have. Sorry, I need to change screen as well. For that ah, sorry so to get to the poll so i hope most of you have been able to vote i see just a few more people are still okay so great so i'm sharing results i think most of you will see it so great to hear see that like people are joining and have heard uh, uh, about co-ops um platform co-ops a bit less which is guess why you're here um, and interesting to see also about how what brings you here um, so quite a diverse audience so thanks a lot that's really helpful for us okay so let me share my screen again great so moving on I'm going to start just with a broad description of what, what we mean by, by platforms and, and platform businesses and then move on to the concept of, of platform cards. So this is just a very broad definition that I find quite useful. A platform business is a business that uses a digital platform to trade, connect people and or pool resources and data. Now, we've all experienced how the platform economy has grown in the last decade and how it is more and more dominant in our lives, especially uh, in the last two years with the, with the COVID pandemic and, and how it makes a lot of things easier for us, accessing services, um, ordering food, uh, et cetera. Unfortunately, though, it comes also with um, quite a lot of negative externalities or, or consequences for those that use them or provide services. So I'm just going to go through a few of these. Um, so first of all, what we're, you know, people are becoming more and more aware of is that platforms collect and hold large amounts of users' data and do not always disclose how they use them and, and don't necessarily use that information in an appropriate way. Um, there are also problems with the way this data is protest, processed and the bias that's embedded in the algorithms and how these algorithms uh, allow the, the uh, who runs the platform to exert really top down control, um, where, for example, uh, hourly rates are determined simply by an algorithm or uh, accounts are deactivated and so effectively users uh, are fi fired. Um, through this concentration of data and the way the platforms are set up, um, this gives a lot of power to, to the owners of the platform. 
And so we're seeing that platforms are perpetuating dangerous forms of surveillance capitalism, leading to concerns about privacy, online security, and right, racial and gender bias. Um, and we're seeing how they're really impacting negatively communities and workers' rights. So for example, they facilitate dependency on precarious income streams uh, and working conditions. They can have negative impacts on local communities as they introduce disruptive economic, economic practices, uh, Airbnb being an example. Um, and they, they create, they openly oppose uh, collective action or, or create obstacles for it. And what we have seen is that they have also really benefited and have um, exploited it, uh, exploited it economic crises, both the financial crisis uh, and the current COVID uh, crisis where platform businesses have seen an exponential growth. Um, and their business models are very ag aggressive and extractive in nature. They, dis they extract disproportionate value from other people's work uh, and assets. Um, and they um, tend to want to create monopolies uh, by becoming the single provider of a service um, or by destroying their and by destroying their competitors or buying them up and this is very much driven also by their finance financing model uh, which is very often based on VC funding which requires very high returns um, and to grow so exponentially they tend to aggressively lobby governance or attempt to at least circumvent uh, regulations now, this all sounds horrifying, I know, <laughs> and we're obviously not the only people talking about this, but um, what, what we question is, is technology really the root cause of these problems, or is it the business model on which they're built? And is there actually a lot of potential in the technology in solving big challenges uh, that we're living today? Um, and is it not maybe, if we were to propose a different business model behind these platform that, that these impacts would be completely different. So what if platforms were collectively owned by their users, by their providers, and they were democratically controlled? So just to use our imagination, imagine if Deliveroo was owned uh, and managed and democratically controlled by their riders, if Spotify was managed and controlled by the musician, by musicians, um, or if Airbnb was controlled by travelers and hosts and invested um, profits into local communities. Um, what is really exciting for us is that actually these um, alternatives already exist in the cooperative movement. And our aim is really to, to support and grow these initiatives. So we've got a, a great initiative that is Europe-wide, which is Co-op Cycle, which provides uh, software for courier cops to set up their own cooperative. Uh, we have Resonate, which is a music streaming platform owned and controlled by musicians and listeners. Uh, and we have Fairbnb, which is uh, community-powered tourism, as they uh, talk about themselves where any profit is reinvested in the, in the community and they work very closely with, with local authorities. And there is so much potential for more. And this is where we really want to support this, this sector. Um, so let's go a bit more into detail of, of what we mean by platform co-ops. Um, so a platform co-op is democratically owned and controlled business that uses an online platform or mobile app to trade, connect people and or pool resources and data. Now, a platform co-op will operate according to cooperative principles. I won't go too much into detail. Uh, they're there uh, and we've got both organizations have got lots of resources on their websites to dig deeper into them. But the basic idea is that the cooperative value, uh, values and principles define both the way the business is run, but also shape the way technology is used and, and determine how data is collected and, and processed. Um, and the opposite is also interesting to look at. So what, what can technology do to, to so support cooperatives and, and transform them? So um, here are just some aspects that I just wanted to go through because uh, just to go a bit more into detail of, of the, some of the great potentials of, of technology, digital technology. So 
one of the main things that we talk about when we talk about platforms is that they um, eliminate the middleman. And so the, 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 the opportunity to really put people in connection, providers and receivers of a survey service directly in connection between them. It allows people to choose how much they want to either provide a service or a user. They can have more autonomy in choosing a service. Um, technology allows us for a much more, uh, much broader democratic um, collaboration as well and participation. Technology provide, reduces some of the barriers for people to participate in organizations. And it has a lot of potential because of the network effects. So in general platform cards, we expect them to, to scale more, more rapidly than, than traditional uh, SMEs. Um, and though costs, obviously there are costs starting up, um, at the, you can start start up with a relatively um, low capital compared to, to um, at some other types of businesses that, that aim to scale. Um, so I'm just gonna go over a few, uh, Petra, please hurry me on if I'm taking up too much time, um, but I'm just gonna go through a few examples uh, and I tend to group them in mainly two types of platform co-ops. Um, here are a few examples of platform co-ops where the, the technology really allows providers of a service and the receivers of the service to come together through the platform, either through a booking platform or in the case of a school, the classes uh, uh, um, provided through a platform, et cetera. Um, and what is interesting is that we see mainly two types of, uh, of platform uh, co-ops forming in this way. There's some in which, uh, like in the case of Signalize, where we'll hear a bit more about them later, in which both the providers and the receivers of a service are all members of the cooperative. And that's the case, in their case, that deaf people and British Sign Language translators. There are other cases in which, and that's the same as Equal Care Co-op, where the providers of care and the receivers of care uh, are part of the uh, membership. Uh, in the case of Red Brick Language School, which is a school for uh, ang English language school, um, it's run and owned by the teachers. And this is because the population of users is much more transient. They might follow a course for two or three years, but they don't need the ongoing um, service. Um, and then we have another type of, of platform co-op where I talk to them, I talk about them more as like infrastructure <laughs> co-ops where the technology really provides a way for existing big businesses uh, to connect uh, with new uh, clients. And so we'll hear more about the Open Food Network later, which really wants to transform the food supply chain and provides a shop front for uh, local farmers or ethical shops. We've got Co-op Cycle, which provides um, a software for small worker courier cops to set up uh, autonomously, but can use the software to, to um, for, for the rest of the local restaurants. And then co-cars where the software allows people to, to book electric uh, vehicles. Um, so the next few slides are just really about the support that we provide, um, but I'm obviously happy to answer any further questions on what we mean by platform co-ops and, and uh, the examples I mentioned. Um, so, we sort of map out the journey in, in what is also often seen as the traditional startup journey of a, of a tech company. Um, so there's an initial phase um, that comes before you actually incorporate as a business, where you're exploring the idea, understanding what the, the ideal cooperative structure is for, for your platform, uh, identifying the founding team, um, then and already maybe testing and understanding your users. Uh, after incorporation, you can finally start trading, attracting grant funding, uh, building your platform, and we call this the pre-seed stage. And then there's a moment in which you're like, okay, well, we want to launch um, uh, and grow, and we're ready to do this. Uh, and very often, that just before this happens, uh, platform co-ops have, have raised uh, equity, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, this is the typical funding stages that we've seen of platform co-ops in the UK. So in this pre-seed uh, phase, 
um, where you can't start attracting grant funding because you're not an entity yet. Uh, we see um, founders actually may be able to attract funding as uh, individuals, so they're like fellowships or founder grants, uh, but also platform co-ops tend to do a crowdfunding campaign, and that's really useful because you start to test your idea, test your marketing strategies, uh, and identifying your users, uh, and uh, you know accumulating a little bit of uh, money to at least um, get started. Uh, in year zero, so from when you incorporate in the first year, uh, we've seen uh, platform carbs raise around 75k. Uh, um, and then in, in the following years, with a share offer, uh, on average, sort of uh, raising around 350,000 uh, through equity. Um, platform carbs are a really early stage, so we're still, you know, this is the information we have. We still haven't got to the stage when we've got lots of platform carbs that are growing and scaling rapidly. So hopefully in two or three years, I'll have more data about that. Um, and this is just to give you, I mean, there's a lot of information here. Don't, don't worry about taking it all in, but in general, the total investment in platform carbs has been of uh, 3 million. And this is in the form of community shares. Again, I can't go into detail here, but it's a form of equity. Um, that is typical of the cooperative movement. Up to now, it has been used mainly for asset-based uh, community uh, businesses, so saving the local cinema or the, or, uh, the local culture centre, etc. Um, we're seeing that this form of, uh, of uh, cooperative equity is being used uh, by platform cults quite successively. Um, we saw it first with the media, platforms, so New Internationalist, Community Channel, Positive News, and more recently with Sinalyze, we'll hear a bit more from them, Equal Care Co-op uh, and a co uh, reach raising between 250 and 600k through community shares. And what is also interesting is that these community share offices have been able to attract institutional investment in the form of match funding as well from grant funders. Um, so it's a combination of, of um, inst yeah, institutional investment and, and member investment. Um, the main form of support we're providing to platform cops currently is uh, through an accelerator program, um, which is a business support program of 10 weeks where we bring together a cohort of teams that are really at the early stages of setting up their platform cop, and it concludes with a pitch event. Uh, where they present their, their, their idea and there's um, a £10,000 uh, prize fund provided by the Cooperative Bank. Um, uh, sorry, just a few more slides and then I'm done. Um, who is it for? It is for a team, so we need at least you to be a team of at least two members. Uh, that's because we really want to support those that are nearly ready to incorporate and obviously to set up a co-op you need at least two people um, that already have identified the cooperative model as the right model for them but might not know which of the cooperative models is appropriate for their business and that are looking to register in the UK by the by the end of the year and so we really support you from that idea phase to making it a reality and being able to launch your business the application window is open. Uh, you can apply until the 6th of March and the accelerator will run from the end of April to the end of June uh, with the pitch event on the 15th of July. Um, here are a few more resources that uh, we'll share in the chat um, in the next few minutes. Um, there will be two webinars coming up in February. If you want to hear more about the accelerator itself, um, do come along and you can ask any questions about that. Do register to the Unfound newsletter where we provide any information about events, um, uh, grants, etc. cetera, the, uh, anything related to digital and co-ops. We cover that it, uh, once a month. Uh, and you know, visit our, our, our Unfound website where you have more information about platform co-ops. Um, beyond the accelerator, there are other ways that we can support platform co-ops. Um, so, and this is depending on, you know, also on what stage you are at, you might not be interested in that very early stage support, but if you're in the process of setting up your platform co-op, we have a interactive tool on our website that really helps you in the various phases 
uh, uh, before you set up a, a co-op, all the things that you need to decide uh, um, and helps you through that. Um, and then uh, as Petra mentioned, we have the Hive program uh, that offers up to 10 days bespoke business support, uh, mentoring and training. We, uh, our advice team also offers uh, various training sessions. You can see all of them on our website. Um, and can also provide direct support. And do also visit the Community Shares Unit part of our website where there's more information about raising um, shares, community shares. Um, sorry, this is a lot of information. So I might just put these in the chat, but there's a very active uh, international network of platform co-ops. Um, and so there's a lot we can learn from, from other co-ops setting uh, up in other countries. Um, so it's worth looking at the platform.coop website and subscribing to, to their mailing list. Um, and then there are also a lot of international lists or simply swat following uh, the hashtag platform co-op on Twitter. You can really engage with the international community, which is quite active. Um, and that's it. These are my details. So thanks very much, Vika, for that excellent introduction to platform cooperatives. Um, and I, I saw some questions in the chat, which hopefully we can pick up at, at the end. Um, I'm going to hand over to our um, speaker, Jen Smith from Sinalize, who's going to talk about their um, cooperative that we supported through the Hive and, and through the platform cops. Um, so over to you, Jen, and hopefully you can share your presentation. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just get this set up now. Okay, so um, I have too many slides really for my allocated five minutes. So I'm just gonna whiz through them. I believe everyone's getting a copy of these afterwards. Um, so I won't spend too long on each slide. Um, and apologies, I'm looking that way because I'm sharing on that screen. So I'm not, if I don't look into the camera, that's why I'm not doing my emails in between slides. Um, so I'm Jen Smith from um, Signalize Co-op and we are a cooperative of deaf people who receive services and interpreters and other professionals for deaf people who deliver services. Um, so our governance model is a multi-stakeholder model. Um, when we, very early on in the day, I attended a presentation um, with Petra, who's on the call, um, run by, via the Hive series. And it blew my mind when we realized that we could actually have a cooperative that involved deaf people in it, and we didn't have to just be a workers co-op but that we could actually involve the service users in the business model. Um, and that's, it's the first time anything like this has been done within the deaf community before. And it's a real benefit to our services and, and a USP of ours. Um, unfortunately, this is the, an all too common story where family members are relied upon to interpret for deaf service users because of failings in interpreter service delivery or failings in the way that interpreter services are contracted. Um, this tends to happen about once per month where a family member has to be involved in interpreting for their deaf family members. Um, and we've actually had two incidences recently in the Merseyside area. So it's not a problem that's going away, but it's definitely the problem that we're set up to solve. And part of the reason this happens is that users aren't involved, which is, again, one of the benefits of being a multi-stakeholder cooperative and that the users are an inherent part of the business model. Previously, agencies have been, um, they act as middlemen and they, some of them don't even have that much knowledge of British Sign Language or the deaf community. So they're not the experts in the services that deaf people need to receive and yet they're holding contracts. Partly, some of them are large spoken language agencies who get BSL as part of a very small, minute part of that contract. And it's just a great disservice to the deaf community and interpreters. Sometimes it's a, a matter of staff training. They don't know who has the, con the contract. 
And sometimes it's just the business model of a private agency there to make more money for the shareholders and not really care about the service that they're delivering or the community that they're delivering it to. And we've had lots of problems with unsustainable fees, which Nobsley, the union for BSL in churches, has been fighting against for a number of years now. And as we can see there, it costs £30 million um, pounds a year to the NHS because of these failures. And often deaf people just don't know who's going to be there at the appointment. So some of the things that we've put in place enable the deaf community to understand who's going to be there on the day. So our ethos is that we're the experts, we're the ones that should be delivering services, not a private agency or someone who, a business that doesn't know anything about the deaf community. We, we do this by having regular meetings and because we have specialist knowledge and community ownership there is very important. It feels like it's very much our business as a community and that somebody else isn't delivering it for people in the community, but we're actually doing it for ourselves. And that's really important. So that's our journey, some of which um, Vika mentioned is exactly the journey that we've been through. Um, we started discussions, we had a lot of support from the Hive, which really acted like a springboard for us and enabled us to get off the ground really quickly. We incorporated six months later as signco.io, which on reflection was an awful name and we had awful branding, <laughs> but we managed to get some funding to turn that around. Um, we rebranded and we raised 328,000 in community shares and again had um, support from Co-ops UK to do that. And the biggest win that we've had so far is we're now the sole supplier on an NHS framework agreement in Merseyside, which is a massive win for us. And it's been an absolute pleasure to deliver services now as a cooperative in the area. I, we feel very much as if we fit into this new post COVID economy and we're fighting to be part of that economy and get services to recognize our value, which because of the framework agreement, we now are building up um, an evidence base of exactly how we can deliver services a lot better than some of the other players in the market out there. Um, so how do we compete with everyone else? Well, we're the experts and using tech, we have lower overheads, a, a leaner business model. Most important, uh, very importantly, we have less administration fees and therefore we don't put pressure um, downward pressure on fees to the end supplier, which are the interpreters. We have many discussions about pricing, about what's reasonable and what's sustainable, not just for the business, but individual interpreters. So we, we don't operate in an extractive economic model. We operate to make sure that every, the whole business as a whole is sustainable for everybody. And we co-design with users as much as we can. And that's that's work that's very much ongoing. We're putting a lot of resource now back into the platform since we raise money for community shares um, in order to continue improving what we have, not just for all of the users, but for the services that we're providing for so NHS organisations. And the users are the, the people power can't be underestimated with with our business in the fact that a lot of business is being bought into the cooperative by the members themselves, whether that's the user members or the professionals that work and own the co-op. So this is just some possible tips on how to get started, um, which will be shared a bit later. That's a brilliant book. Um, some of the resources that Vika had shared uh, to do with the platform cooperative consortium, that's all worth reading. That's a sneak peek of the platform, which is in beta at the moment. That's the one we're doing a lot of work on. So one of the things that we do is we um, we make sure that we get the, for example, the text number of the deaf person who has an appointment and we include the profile link. So one of the things that happened at the start of the contract was an interpreter turned up at a GP surgery. And the deaf person said, oh, I knew you were coming. Your photo popped up on my phone. Did the GP send this to me? And she was like, no, no, that came from Signalize. So it was the link to their profile on the platform, which nobody else does in the country, but we take the time to do that. And it just means that a deaf person can look up that interpreter if they don't know them already and find out um, some publicly available information about them, such as the work that they like to do, uh, what their name is, um, which organization they're registered with. It's something that alleviates a lot of stress and anxiety for deaf people as they're on their way to appointments. 
Um, so for us, it's about continuing work that we're doing on the platform. We also have a video service that we're delivering to um, NHS organisations on Merseyside. And it's about continuing to test that and develop it alongside users um, to add features that they may require and also integrate that into the actual platform itself a bit better. So we're continuing that work at the moment. We've also applied for funding for an outreach worker so that we can increase the membership of deaf users on Merseyside, which has been something quite that's quite difficult to do in the pandemic um, with a lack of events face to face in the community. Um, so what we'd like to do is actually employ somebody who is deaf themselves to liaise with the local community better to engage and um, to do events and also provide training because what we've what we have known is that there's a lot of digital exclusion in Merseyside with deaf users so we think that there's going to be a lot of training needed on how to use the video service um, to encourage uptake of that and increase people's access to health services and reduce health inequalities, which was part of the um, tender negotiation at the time. Um, we're recruiting quite heavily at the moment because what we're finding is we're scaling quite rapidly. So we need people around us quite desperately, actually. We're looking for a bookings administrator at the moment. So if you know anyone that's interested in cooperatives um, and might want to work with us, then please do encourage them to apply. And details are on our website at the moment, which is signalize.coop. Um, and we, of course, are working hard to increase business and gain more contracts so that we can keep scaling. And like I've said before, we're just investing a lot of time and energy into the platform and the tech itself to just keep streamlining our model. So that's what we're doing. And if you'd like to get in contact directly, there are our details there. Sorry, it was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but the, I believe the presentation is being shared later and I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Thanks very much, Jen. I think that should be a very inspiring story for others who are looking at that journey. And obviously they can see it's taking a little bit of time to get to where you are now. And it's great that you've now got that contract and that you are rapidly growing. So I hope we can continue to support you on that journey, particularly as members of Cooperatives UK. So thanks, Jen. So I'm going to hand over to our final speaker of today, um, Kayleigh Reid, um, as we mentioned in our presentation before from Open Food Network, um, they've been established a little bit longer than Signalize, so um, they can, um, hopefully Kay can also talk you through their journey and what they do. Um, and again, it's just another example of cooperatives operating in different sectors in, in this way. So thanks very much, um, and over to you Kay, thanks very much. So thank you Petra, and thanks for inviting us here to speak today. Sorry I'm a bit husky, I'm recovering from COVID, so hopefully my voice will, will stick for the session. Um, so I'm just going to share some slides. Okay. So the OFN is essentially it's a global collaboration that was founded in Australia in 2012. And now we're an international community and we're in um, 20 countries and more join us every year. So we're constantly growing. And our global network of local instances work together to develop open and shared resources, knowledge and software, essentially to support a better food system. And our flagship uh, project is our open source software platform, and that can be used to set up online shop fronts of food enterprises, but it's also designed to enable collaboration uh, between food enterprises, between suppliers and producers with food enterprises, and people who've used the power of this feature to create food collectives, manage food hubs and to take their farmers markets online. And being a global collaboration, we hold everything we create as part of the commons, so it doesn't belong to a single entity, but instead it belongs to the whole community. Um, and we operate on an open and transparent governance model. In reality, this looks like a lot of stuff happening on Slack, which is open for everyone to see. Um, we use collaborative decision making within our global network, and we work collaboratively with farmers and food enterprises in each country to design software and resources that support their needs. So onto the Open Food Network UK. So we were founded in 2015 by two members of the OFN admin team and also our first uh, food enterprise software user, Tamer Valley Food Hub. Um, so I'm not a founding member, I've been with the OFN for two years, so um, I couldn't really give the founders journey um, justice, um, but I can talk today about how we work as a cooperative today and what that looks like. 
Um, so our team is now uh, nine people, so we're constantly growing, we've just recruited two new people, and we're looking for a finance and admin lead, so, um, lead, so growing to 13 people soon, um, so our team's also growing, and um, our goal has always been that the community of food enterprises using the Open Food Network are co-owners and designers and creators of the platform, and we work with food enterprises that are driven by um, their communities and have social and ecological values at the core of what they do and we help them to grow online and to coordinate regionally and streamline their admin processes and our vision is for an interconnected uh, ecosystem of community food enterprises which exist and thrive in a food economy which is more diverse vibrant and inclusive celebrating both provenance and culture and we want improved markets for ecologically produced food to encourage more producers to adopt ecologically sustainable practices building the topsoil and biodiversity. And we also want healthy communities where community food enterprises, producers and local institutions collaborate together to enable communities to eat healthier food. And this is what we do. So as I mentioned before, the main thing, um, that our, our main project is our, is our software platform. And that enables shop fronts with tools and features that make running a community food enterprise simple. And another massive part of what we do is we support food enterprises with um, training and mentoring online um, and in person as well to share experience and problem solve collectively. And this strengthens our network and movements of community food systems. And this is where my role in, in, the, in our cooperative fits in, in that I, have, I, I support food enterprises with their marketing. And I also have been running like a series of webinars where food enterprises can meet each other and create their own bonds and networks together, um, among other things as well. And <clears throat> so our platform cooperative is growing from the real needs of food hubs and farmers across the UK and globally. And I think it really helped that as part of our, our, our founders team, one of the food enterprises that uses the Open Food Network um, was one of our kind of founding members. Um, and also during COVID, it showed how vital digital infrastructure can be, um, but without the cooperative economy, the gains are private. And also building software with social aims is difficult to fund. So our funding model works by spreading the cost of building the collective. And because of this, um, that means we can pool our funds globally and pay for our software delivery team. Also, all our code is open source and we put effort into building and expanding our community with processes for welcoming, onboarding and managing contributors. And just a little bit more about our, our UK team. Um, so the way that we operate is we're non-hierarchical. And what that means is also we avoid depend over dependence on specific individuals within the team to do a certain thing. And we ensure that every role can be done by others in the team. Um, and that's also one of the reasons I'm presenting here um, as well. So we try and share these responsibilities with the team um, and encourage each team member to grow and expand their skills so that they can take on more things, which makes us more resilient as an organization. And we also operate according to sociocracy principles, um, which means that it's really important to us as a collective to create psychologically safe environments and our decision-making is made through uh, consent as opposed to voting, for example. Um, we also are holocracy, holocracy, I always pronounced that wrong. Um, which is a method of decentralized management and decision making is made through kind of self organizing teams rather than through um, a traditional kind of management hierarchy, which really kind of fosters the sense of uh, individual leadership within teams. Um, and we also operate with um, transparency. So everything that we do, the work that we do is kind of um, shared in a space where we can all see, see what's happening. Um, and yeah, that's that's what I have to share today um, about us. Thanks very much, Kay. That's brilliant. And, and uh, it's great to see um, how you've grown over that time and that you're also expanding. And, and like you say, it's become even more important, our food supplies and where it comes from and, and who grows it and, 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 and supporting them. So um, great to hear about the network and particularly how you organise yourselves as a co-op and, and your decision making. Um, so I'm going to, there's been um, some questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to see if we have time now just to answer some of those questions. Um, and if, if there are still questions people want to ask, please do keep posting them in the chat. And we've got 
we've got a few minutes left of at the end of this presentation to try and respond to those. So I think the first question I had, um, which was probably one for Vika to answer, was from Stan. Um, and he was suggesting whether it might be possible to start the platform cooperative, maybe as a sole trader and then kind of onboard, um, you know, and become a cooperative later on in, in, in the journey. Um, and so I don't know if you can respond to that, Vika. And I know from other Hive webinars, people are always asking, well, how do I find my fellow cooperators in the first instance and start my co-op? Yeah, so um, it depends how quickly you want to go. You know, so we see in, in most co-ops, there is um, a, a, a leading founder that has an idea. Um, but to transform that idea into reality, you do need a team and you need other people that believe in your idea. And if you're not able to find other people that be, believe in your idea, then maybe you have to really understand and, and question at the, the validity of that idea. We see that the cooperative model works best when you are really responding to a need of people and that the people that have those needs are the founders themselves. Um, and so bringing together people, if you share that need together, uh, bringing together those people to build your cooperative is, is the most likely way to make it succeed and, 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 um, and grow, uh, et cetera. Um, so involving people from the start is really, really important. Uh, and beyond that, even for any business, um, if you want to, it to grow, you need a diversity of skills. Um, so we see, for example, the um, platform carbs that are led maybe by a developer that is able to build the platform really quickly. They might start off quicker than, than other platforms, but then they really struggle to build the community around their platform and understand the users' needs, et cetera. So really starting from the beginning with a, a team that collects those different skills um, and, and a full understanding uh, of, of what you know, the, the users need, the providers needs, and how they can be involved from the start is, is really, really uh, important. But that doesn't mean that a business cannot transform from being a sole trader or a limited company into a cooperative related stage. It just we feel that it makes it more sustainable if you embed the purpose from the start in, in your constitution. I think that's a really good uh, response. We can again, from my experience, having that kind of um, vision um, that everyone can sign up to and understand is really important at the beginning um, and is a collaborative um, process. So I think that's really helpful. So just looking at um, other questions, this one I think is for Jen at Sig Signalize um, from Robert, um, asking if you developed your platform internally, I presume that's with you know your own resources and expertise or whether you developed it, um, you outsource that work. Does that make sense, Jen? Yes, it does. And the answer is both. Um, so when we first started off, um, I've got some coding experience as well as being an interpreter of 16 years. And we started off with some off the shelf um, software and myself and another uh, developer, we just got cracking with that and made some quite heavy customizations on on there. Um, from the start, I've pretty much been the project manager for the whole of the platform. Um, but we've outsourced, I think we're on five five developer teams for different parts of the technology and I, I oversee all of that development and project manage that so we've had quite a lot of advice from different people so the short answer is both um so i i hope that that answers that question and i know um different cooperatives take different approaches and i think vika was saying before that um lots of the cycle couriers use a particular software that's already been developed and that they can then use. So there's different approaches. Um, so we've also had a question, I think, for Kay at um, Open Food Network. Um, asks, are public sector organizations part of the networks to create local supply chains? And then I, I don't know if it's one and the same question or a subsequent question. And have anchor customers acquire large quantities of food? Um, so I suppose it's, you know, I guess it's what kind of members you have and, and how does that help you to kind of scale and, and, and supply more food? Is that, is that essentially what they're asking? If that's right, Alan. 
Thanks, I'll, 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 I'll try and answer. And, um, public sector organisations are not currently part of the network, but we do work on projects in conjunction with public sector organisations. And um, so we've got one project we're running at the moment, which is to support uh, new um, Welsh, um, new food hubs to be established in Wales. Um, and that's in conjunction with um, the Welsh government. So, yeah, so we do do things in conjunction with public sector organisations, but in terms of as part of our network, that's that's not currently the case. Um, but, it, but that also, food enterprises that, that constitute part of our network also do work with their own kind of local authorities or, or like, um, so for example, Tamar Valley Food Hubs have got a fair few different things that they do with their local authorities. So it's more that, not as the OFN directly, we have projects where we work with um, the public sector, but then different food enterprises that are part of our cooperative um, also have their own kind of projects that they work on. I hope that that's, I hope that that's answered that a little bit. Yes, I hope so, Alan, if, this, if, that answers, if it didn't, then please put it in the chat and we'll, we'll respond again. Um, but I think that idea of general collaboration and, and being cooperatives is sort of at the heart of everything we do. Um, so, um, so I hope, hope that's, that's useful. Um, so I think, um, oh, I think Zika was suggesting that she might be able to respond to the second part of Stan's question around, which I've not found out about, um, quantities so, of food and, and at scale. Is that, is that what you're responding to, Zika? Um, would it be feasible to exit as a co-op? Oh, sorry, Stan's question. Sorry, apologies. Yeah. Um, it, it yes, definitely, it's feasible. What I would say. So the question was, uh, would it be feasible to exit as a co-op in say two years? Um, it is feasible. Just be very careful of what legal structure you do choose, uh, legal form you do choose. One of the main issues is if you decide to raise equity. Um, a traditional equity, then it, you would have to negotiate with the, with your shareholders, and and so that puts on quite strong constraints. Um, so so yeah, if if you decide to go for for a sort of okay, I'll start with a non co op and then transition. Um, try to choose a quite a lightweight uh, legal structure, but our advice would be really to embed the purpose um, from the start in your constitution, um, and you can always modify that those articles as well as the organization uh, transforms. You're muted. Oh, I know. I, um, I hope Stan that responds to your question. And uh, yeah, I think and also I mean, we haven't gone into any detail in in this session around legal forms um, because it's a flexible model and properties aren't determined, defined by their legal form, so they're all available. Um, that's a company, a society, a kick or whatever. Um, we have got other Hive webinars, one that I delivered last, last week, which is on online at the moment as a recording that does go into a little bit more detail about legal forms and, and what you should consider. Um, but what we do say is that be, be clear on your business model and, and who your members are going to be. Um, before you kind of decide on, on your legal form, that has to come first. Um, so that should be at the end of that journey, de defining what, what, what to, to choose. So I can't see any more questions in the chat, um, unless anyone wants to type something really quickly now. Um, so I'm going to, um, I, I don't know, um, I suppose the other, I think the, the question that has come up a lot is, is around, you know, how do you find those collaborators? And I think you know, it is about everybody sharing that same vision and, and, and maybe, you know, I know some people, for instance, just start on, on something like Facebook and start a group and trying to start getting interest, or hopefully it just comes from seeing that there's a problem and an opportunity because things aren't being done as well as, well as it should be. Um, so I'm going to ask the speaker if she could share that last slide and then I can talk about what support is, is available. Um, Vika's already told you about the Unfound Accelerator, which is currently open for applications and all the links have been in, in the chat. Um, so if anyone is starting on that journey and wants to have some intensive support, um, they can apply to that. Um, and then the main uh, sort of website links for um, cooperatives at Cooperatives UK who want to start their journey and want to get support is this one here, which is uk.coop forward slash start. 
Um, and you'll see there are lots of funded programs, including the High Business Support Program, the Unfound Accelerator, Community Shares, et cetera, um, as well as the step-by-step -step guides and how you can apply to the High for up to 10 days of um, consultancy support, training, and peer mentoring. Um, that's a program that I particularly run, um, and it's open all year round, um, and we look at um, applications on a monthly basis. Um, we also um, heard earlier in, in the session from my colleague at um, Scottish Enterprise from Cooperative Development Scotland, um, and they can also provide support particularly to businesses um, cooperatives in, in Scotland, um, and that's the link here, so um, scottishenterprise.com forward slash CBS, um, and Suzanne will be the one that will respond to you if you want support there. So ho hopefully that, that's useful. Um, and um, as I say, this session has been recorded. It will be sent around to everyone that's participated, but it will also be uploaded to our website. Um, and you can also see on our website that we're continuing to run with these um, webinars, and you can see the recordings of our previous webinars if you want to find out more about cooperatives. Um, so I think we're, we're slightly ahead of time. So I'm just seeing if there's anyone else um, has any more questions or observations, or maybe any of our speakers or panelists wanted to add anything? Um, we have a couple more minutes left. Um, I think I think we have. It looks like we have in the chat. We have people here from across the world, not just in the UK, um, joining us. Is that right? Um, sorry, I'm just checking the chat if there's any more questions. So I don't think there's any more questions. And I guess we'll we'll finish it there unless anyone else wants to add anything at this point. Suzanne, is there anything you wanted to say um, about the support that, that you can offer at this stage or anything else you want to add? Uh, well, I've added my details into the chat for everybody. We are we are based in Scotland. Um, but yeah, if anybody's interested in discussing uh, their project um, and the support that CDS offer, please contact me. My email address is in the chat there. But I think, um, yeah, between the two organisations, we're, we're more than capable of making sure that everybody gets to the right place at, at, at the right stage of, of your journey. Okay, thanks very much. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers um, for joining us today. Uh, Vika from Cooperatives UK um, and Jen um, from Sig Signalize and also Kay from Open Food Network. It's always one, wonderful to hear the stories of our members and our cooperatives and, and to get the insight of what it's really like to run the co-op. Um, and I know that they're always um, willing to speak to new cooperatives and, and share that journey in, 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 in um, person as well. So thanks again um, for, to everyone. Um, I'm just gonna just check the chat filing just to make sure there wasn't anything else. Um, yeah, so it looks like everyone um, enjoyed the session. So thanks again, and we'll finish it there and um, look forward to maybe seeing some of you at our EverHive webinars and, and maybe coming back to us for support. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.